Section 10 of Astounding Stories, March 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories, March 1930. Vandals of the Stars by A. T. Locke. Part One. It came suddenly, without warning, and it brought consternation to the people of the world. A filament of flame darted down the dark skies one moonless night, and those who saw it believed at first that it was a meteor. Instead of streaking away into oblivion, however, it became larger and larger, until it seemed as though some vagrant blazing star was about to plunge into the earth and annihilate the planet and every vestige of life upon it. But then it drew slowly to a stop, high up in the atmosphere, where it remained motionless, glowing white and incandescent against the Stygian background of the overcast skies. In shape it resembled a zeppelin, but its dimensions very apparently exceeded by far those of any flying craft that ever had been fabricated by the hand of man. As it hung, poised, high up in the air, it gradually lost its dazzling glow and became scarlet instead of white. Then, as it continued to cool, the color swiftly drained from it, and in a few minutes, it shone only with the dull and ugly crimson of an expiring ember. In a half hour after it first had appeared, its effulgence had vanished completely, and it was barely visible to the millions who were staring up toward it from the earth. It seemed to be suspended directly above Manhattan, and the inhabitants of New York were thrown into a feverish excitement by the strange, an unprecedented phenomenon. For it scarcely had come to a stop, and certainly it had not been poised aloft for more than a few minutes, when most of those who had not actually witnessed its sensational appearance were apprised of the inexplicable occurrence by the radio vision, which were scattered throughout the vast metropolis. In theaters and restaurants and other gathering places, as well as in millions of homes, a voice from the worldwide broadcasting tower announced the weird visitant, and its image, as it glowed in the night, was everywhere transmitted to the public. Only a short time after it first had been observed, people were thronging rooftops, terraces, and streets, and gazing with awe and wonder at the great luminous object that was floating high above them. There were those who thought that the world was coming to an end, and they either were dumb with fright or strident with hysteria. People with more judgment and a smattering of scientific knowledge dismissed the thing as some harmless meteorological manifestation that, while interesting, was not necessarily dangerous. And there were many inclined to incredulity and skepticism, who believed that they were witnessing a hoax or an advertising scheme of some new sort. But as the moments went by, the world commenced to become stirred and alarmed by the reports which came over the radio visors. For powerful planes and metal-shelled zeppelins had climbed swiftly aloft to investigate the incomprehensible thing that was poised high above Manhattan, and almost unbelievable reports were being sent earthward. Dirk Vanderpool had been sitting alone on the broad terrace of his apartment that occupied the upper stories of the great Gotham Gardens building, when he saw that streak of fire slip down against the darkness of the night. For a moment, he, too, had believed that he was watching a meteor, but when he saw it come to a slow stop and hang stationary in the heavens, 
he rose to his feet with an exclamation of surprise. For a while he gazed upward with an expression of astonishment on his face, and then he turned as he heard someone walking softly in his direction. It was Barstow, his valet, and the eyes of the man were alive with fear. "'What is that thing, Mr. Vanderpool?' he asked in a voice that trembled with alarm. Barstow was a man of middle age, diminutive in size, and he had the appearance of being nearly petrified with terror. "'They are saying over the televisor that—' "'What are they saying about it?' asked Dirk somewhat impatiently. "'That no one can explain what it is,' continued Barstow. "'It must be something terrible, Mr. Vanderpool.' "'Wheel out the lucoscope,' ordered Dirk. Barstow disappeared into the apartment and returned with a cabinet that was mounted on small, rubber-tired wheels. The top of it was formed of a metallic frame in which a heavy, circular, concave glass was fitted. The frame was hinged in front so that it could be raised from the rear and adjusted to any angle necessary to catch the light rays from any distant object. Within the cabinet the rays passed through an electrical device that amplified them millions of times, thus giving a clear, telescopic vision of the object on which the lucoscope was focused. This instrument, years before, had supplanted entirely the old-fashioned telescopes, which not only had been immense and unwieldy, but which also had a very limited range of vision. Dirk adjusted the light converger so that it caught the rays that were being emanated by the weird and shimmering mass that was suspended almost directly above the lofty terrace on which he was standing. Then he switched on the current and glanced into the eyepiece of the apparatus. For several moments he remained silent, studying the image that was etched so vividly on the ground glass within the lucoscope. It is a queer thing, there is no doubt about that, he confessed when finally he raised his head. It resembles a gigantic zeppelin in shape, but it does not seem to have any undercarriage, or, as far as I can see, any indication of propellers or portholes. I would say, though, Barstow, that it might be a ship from some other planet, if it wasn't for the fact that it seems to be in an almost molten state. Dirk again looked into the lucoscope, and then he made a few adjustments with a thumb screw that projected from the side of the apparatus. It is up about 40,000 feet, he told Barstow, and it must be more than a half mile in length. Probably, he added, it is a planetary fragment of some odd composition that is less responsive to gravitation than the materials with which we are familiar. You will find, Barstow, that there is nothing about it that science will not be able to explain. That will be all now, he concluded. Barstow walked over the terrace and disappeared into the apartment. Dirk, left alone, wheeled the lucoscope over by the chair in which he had been sitting, and near which a radio visor was standing. He switched on the ladder and listened to the low but very distinct voice of the news dispatcher. And planes and zeppelins now are starting up to investigate the strange phenomenon. Again, Dirk placed an eye to the lens of the lucoscope, and once more the thing leaped into his vision. The powerful machine brought it so close to him that he could see the heat waves quiver up from it. The light that it radiated illuminated the night for thousands of feet, and Dirk could see, by means of that crimson glare, that many planes and zeppelins were circling around the mysterious visitant. None of them, however, approached the alien freak, the heat apparently being too intense to permit close inspection. Dirk himself was tempted, for a moment, 
to jump into a plane and go up and take a look at the fiery mass. But, after a moment's consideration, he decided that it would be far more interesting and comfortable to remain right where he was and listen to the reports which were being sent down from above. Thus far there seems to be no cause for alarm, and people are advised to remain calm. Careful observations of the luminous monster are being made, and further reports concerning it will be broadcast. Dirk Vanderpool rose to his feet, walked to the coping of the terrace, and peered into the magnoscope that was set into the wall. He saw that the street, far below him, was jammed with struggling people, and the device through which he was looking brought their faces before him in strong relief. Dirk was deeply interested, and at the same time gravely concerned, as he studied the upturned countenances in the mob. Fear, despair, reckless abandon, mirth, doubt, religious ecstasy, and all the other nuances in the gamut of human emotions and passions were reflected in those distorted visages which were gazing skyward. The silvery humming of a bell diverted his attention from the scene of congestion below him, and, turning away, he walked across the terrace and into the great living room of his luxurious abode. Stepping to the televisor, he turned a tiny switch, and the face of a girl appeared in the glass panel that was framed above the sound box. He smiled as he lifted the receiver and placed it to his ear. "'What is the matter, Inga?' he asked. "'You look as if you were expecting, well, almost anything disastrous.' "'Oh, Dirk, what is that thing?' the girl asked. "'I really am frightened.' He could see by the expression in her blue eyes that she, too, was becoming a victim of the hysteria that was taking possession of many people. I wouldn't be alarmed, Inga, he replied reassuringly. I don't know what it is, and no one else seems to be able to explain it. But it is frightful and uncanny, Dirk, the girl insisted, and I am sure that something terrible is going to happen. I wish, she pleaded, that you would come over and stay with me for a little while. I am all alone, and... All right, Inga, he told her. I will be with you in a few minutes. He hung up the receiver of the televisor and clicked off the switch. The image of the golden-haired girl to whom he had been speaking slowly faded from the glass. Attiring himself for a short, sixty-mile hop down Long Island, Dirk passed out to the landing stage, and stepping into the cabin of his plane, he threw in the helicopter lever. The machine rose straight into the air for a couple of hundred feet, and then Dirk headed it westward to where the nearest ascension beam sent its red light towering toward the stars. It marked a vertical air lane that led upward to the horizontal lanes of flight. Northbound ships flew between two and four thousand feet. Southbound planes between five and seven thousand feet. Those eastbound confined themselves to the level between nine and eleven thousand feet, while the westbound flyers monopolized the air between twelve and fourteen thousand feet. All planes flying parallel to the earth were careful to avoid those red beacons which marked ascension routes, and the shafts of green light down which descending planes dropped to the earth or into lower levels of travel. When Dirk's altimeter indicated 7,500 feet, he turned the nose of his ship eastward and adjusted his rheostat until his motors, fed by wireless current, were revolving at top speed. The great canyons of Manhattan, linked by arches and highways, which joined and passed through various levels of the stupendous structures of steelite and quartzite, passed swiftly beneath him, and after passing for a few minutes over the deserted surface of Long Island, he completed his sixty-mile flight and brought his ship to a rest on a landing stage that was far up on the side 
of a vast pile that rose up close to the shore of the sound. As soon as he stepped from the door of the cabin, he was joined by a girl who apparently had been lingering there, awaiting his arrival. She was perhaps twenty years old, and she had the golden hair, the light complexion, and the blue eyes which still were characteristic of the women of northern Europe. The slender lines of her exquisite figure, and the supple grace which she displayed when she moved toward Dirk, were evidence, however, of the Latin blood which was in her veins. For Inga Fragoni, the daughter and heiress of Orlando Fragoni, seemed to be a culmination of all of the desirable qualities of the women of the South and those of the North. The terrace on which Dirk had landed was illuminated by lights which simulated sunshine, and their soft, bright glow revealed the violet hue of her eyes and the shimmering gloss of her silken hair. She wore a sleeveless, light blue tunic which was gathered around her waist with a bejeweled girdle. On her tiny feet she wore sandals which were spun of webby filaments of gold and platinum. "'Dirk, I am so glad that you are here,' she exclaimed. "'I felt so much alone when I called you up. "'Dad is locked in the observatory with Professor Knackbaron "'and three or four other men, and the servants, "'well, they all are so terrified that it simply alarms me to have them around.' "'But that is Stanton's plane there, isn't it?' asked Dirk, "'indicating a powerful-looking machine that stood on the terrace. "'Yes, Dirk,' the girl replied. He arrived here three or four minutes before you did. I thought at first that it was you coming, and Dirk, she continued with a note of excitement in her voice, he flew up to look at that thing, and I know that he is as frightened about it as I am. Dirk grunted, but he gave no expression of the dislike and distrust that Stanton aroused in him. The latter, he knew, was very much inclined to look with favor on Inga and his presumption annoyed Dirk, because, while he and the girl had not declared their intention of living together, they were very much in love with each other. "'You will want to hear him tell about it, I know, Dirk,' the girl said. "'I left Stanton up on the garden terrace when I saw you coming down. Come, we will go and join him.' Dirk and Inga strolled slowly along paths which were lined with exotic shrubbery and plants. Here and there a fountain tossed its glittering spray high into the air, while birds, invisible in the feathery foliage, warbled and thrilled entrancingly. Soft music, transmitted from the auditoriums below, blended so harmoniously with the atmosphere of the terraces that it seemed to mingle with and be a part of the drifting, subtle scents of the abundant flowers which bloomed on every side. For these upper terraces of Fragoni's palace were enclosed, during inclement weather, with great glass plates which, at the touch of a button, automatically appeared or disappeared. Winding their way easily upward, Dirk and Inga came finally to a secluded terrace which overlooked the sound. Here they saw Stanton, who was unaware of their approach, looking skyward at the dim and sinister shape which was outlined against the sky. Stanton's brow was contracted, and his expression was filled with apprehension. He started suddenly when he became conscious of the presence of Dirk and the lovely daughter of Fragoni. He rose to his feet, a short man in his forties, stocky in build and somewhat swarthy in complexion. He contrasted very unfavorably with Dirk, who was tall and well-built, and who had abundant blond hair and steady, steel-blue eyes. "'What do you make of that thing, Vanderpool?' he asked, almost ignoring the presence of Inga. "'I don't know enough about it yet to be able to express an opinion,' Dirk replied. "'We will find out about it soon enough,' he added. "'So why worry about it in the meantime?' It is well enough to affect such an attitude, said Stanton, with a touch of sarcasm in his voice, 
but let me tell you, Vanderpool, that there is good reason to worry about it. Dirk frowned at the statement as he saw a shadow pass over the fair face of Inga. That thing up there, continued Stanton with conviction in his voice, is not a natural phenomenon. I flew fairly close to it in my plane, and I know what I am speaking about. That thing is some sort of a monster, Vanderpool, that is made of metal, or of some composition that is an unearthly equivalent of metal. It is a diabolical creation of some sort, that has come from out of the fathomless depths of the universe. He shuddered at the fantasy that his feverish imagination was creating. It is metal, I tell you, he continued, but it is metal that is endowed with some sort of intelligence. I was up there, he breathed swiftly, and I saw it hanging there in the sky, quivering with heat and life. You are nervous, Stanton, said Vanderpool coolly. Get a grip on yourself, man, and look at the thing reasonably. If that thing has intelligence, he added, we will find some way to slay it. Slay it, exclaimed Stanton. How can you expect to slay a mad creation that can leap through space from world to world like a wasp goes darting from flower to flower? How can you kill a thing which not only defies absolute zero, but also the immeasurable heat which its friction with the atmosphere generated when it plunged toward the earth? How can you kill a thing that seems to have brains and nerves and bones and flesh of some strange substance that is harder and tougher than any earthly compound we have discovered? He stopped speaking for a moment. They listened to the voice that was broadcasting from the worldwide tower. Our planes have approached to within a few thousand feet of it and are playing their searchlights over the surface of the Leviathan. It is not a meteorite of any kind that scientists have heretofore examined. Its surface is smooth and unpitted, and shows no apparent effect of the tremendous heat to which it was subjected during its drop through the atmosphere. It seems to be immune to gravity. Its weight must be tremendous, and it is fully three-quarters of a mile long, and between seven and eight hundred feet in diameter at its widest part. But it lies motionless, motionless at about forty thousand feet. It doesn't appear now as if it would prove very dangerous, remarked Dirk. And people are warned again to maintain their composure and to go to their homes and remain there for their own protection and the protection of others. Riots and serious disturbances are reported from cities in all parts of the world. Mobs are swarming the streets of Manhattan and the other boroughs of New York and the police are finding it difficult to restrain the frenzied populations in other centers. There was a pause then of some moments, and then the voice of the broadcaster, vibrant with excitement, was heard again. A plane has made a landing on the surface of the monstrosity, which, it seems, has not only lost its heat, but is becoming decidedly cold. A servant appeared from among the shrubbery and paused before Dirk. There is a call for you, Mr. Vanderpool, he said respectfully. Dirk excused himself, and, entering the sumptuous apartment that opened from the terrace, went to the televisor. He saw the face of Sears, the chief secretary of Fragoni, in the glass panel. There will be a meeting of the council at nine o'clock in the morning, Mr. Vanderpool, came the voice over the wire. Thank you, Sears, replied Dirk. It happens that Stanton is here at the present time. Shall I notify him of the conclave? If you will please, Sears responded. By the way, Mr. Vanderpool, is there anything wrong at your apartment? I tried to call you there before I located you here, and I failed to get any response. I guess that all of my servants have run out from under cover because of their fear of that thing in the sky, Dirk responded. Do you know anything about it, Sears? he asked. It will be discussed at the meeting tomorrow morning, replied Sears shortly. Good night, Mr. Vanderpool. Dirk, upon returning to the terrace, saw that both Stanton and Inga were silently and fearfully looking up into the night. 
A meeting of the council at nine o'clock in the morning, Stanton, Dirk said abruptly. I told Sears I would notify you. I thought that we would be called together very soon, said Stanton. It's concerning that damned thing up there. Perhaps, agreed Dirk carelessly. Well, he added, I believe that I will hop home and get some sleep. Sleep, exclaimed Stanton. Sleep on a night like this? Oh, Dirk, pleaded Inga, stay here with me, won't you? I am not going to bed because I just know that I wouldn't be able to close my eyes. Let him go, Inga, if he wants to sleep, urged Stanton. I will stay here and keep watch with you. And if order is not restored in the streets of Manhattan, within the course of a short time, the authorities will resort to morphite gas to quell the turbulence and rioting. The streets must be frightfully congested, said Inga. It is the first occasion in a long time that the police have had to threaten the use of morphite. We do not want to alarm people unnecessarily, but we have to report, came the hurried voice of the broadcaster, that the monstrous mass that has been hanging above the city just made a sudden drop of five thousand feet and again came to a stop. It is now little more than six miles over Manhattan, and again it has dropped. This time it fell like a plummet for twelve thousand feet. It is now about twenty thousand feet, some four miles above Manhattan, and a cry of alarm came from the lips of Inga as she gazed upward and saw that gigantic, ominous-appearing object loom, dim and vast, in the darkness above them. She went to Dirk and threw her arms around him, as if she were clinging to him for protection. "'Don't leave me, Dirk,' she whispered. "'I can just feel that something terrible is going to happen, and I want you with me.' I'll stay with you, of course, whispered Dirk, something of that feeling of dread and apprehension which so fully possessed his two companions entered into his mind. Don't tremble so, Inga, he pleaded. It is a strange thing, but we will know more about it in the morning. Be calm until then, my dear, if you can. He looked over the shoulder of the girl, whose face was buried against his breast, and he saw a hundred great red and green shafts of light shooting up into the air. Fleeting shadows seemed to pass swiftly up and down them, and he knew that thousands of planes were abroad, some of them seeking the heights, and others dropping down. The great towers of Long Island were all aglow, and it was apparent that few people were sleeping that night. The scarlet sky over Manhattan indicated that the center of the metropolis, too, was alive to the menace of the weird visitant that now was so plainly visible. All night long they remained on the terrace, Dirk and Inga seated close together, and Stanton, at a distance, brooding alone over the disaster which he felt was impending. The illuminated dial of the great clock that was a part of the beacon tower on the Metropole landing field told of the slow passing of the hours. All night long they listened to the reports that came through the radio visor and watched that immobile, threatening monster of metal. But it remained static during the rest of the night, and with the coming of a gray and sunless dawn it still hung there, motionless, silent, and sinister. The next morning the President of the United States of the World from the Capitol at The Hague, issued a proclamation of martial law to become effective at once in all parts of the world. The edict forbade people to leave their homes, and it was vigorously executed wherever the police themselves were not in a state of demoralization. At about the same time, a special meeting of the Supreme Congress was called, the body to remain in session until some solution of the mystery had been arrived at. At the same time that martial law was declared, however, and the special assemblage of lawmakers convened, a statement was issued in which an attempt was made to eliminate from the minds of the people the idea that the undefinable object above the metropolis was at all dangerous. It was indeed suggested 
that it very probably was some sort of new device which had been constructed on the earth and which was being introduced to the people of the world in a somewhat sensational manner by the person or persons who were responsible for it. The fears of the populace were, to some extent, allayed by this means, and some degree of order restored. At nine o'clock, Dirk Vanderpool was shown into the council chamber in the palace of Orlando Fragoni, and he was closely followed by Stanton. Fragoni was already there, and he greeted the two men with a countenance that was serene, but that, nevertheless, revealed indications of concern. He was a man past middle age, tall and strikingly handsome in appearance. His eyes were dark and penetrating, and his forehead, high and wide, was crowned by an abundance of snow-white hair. His voice, while pleasing to the ear, was vibrant with life and energy, and he spoke with the incisive directness of one accustomed to command. For Orlando Fragoni, as nearly as any one man might be, was the ruler of the world. It was in the early part of the twentieth century that wealth had commenced to concentrate into a relatively few hands. This was followed by a period in which vast mergers and consolidations had been effected as a result of the financial power and genius for organization which a few men possessed. A confederation of the countries of the world was brought about by industrial kings who had learned, in one devastating war, that militarism, while it might bring riches to a few, was, in the final analysis, destructive and wasteful. Mankind, the world over, relieved of the menace of war, made more progress in a decade than they had made in any previous century. But all the time, the invisible concentration of power and money continued. And in 1975, the affairs of the world were controlled by five men, of whom Orlando Fragoni was the most powerful and most important. His grandfather had been a small banker, and out of his obscure transactions the great house of Fragoni had arisen. The money power of the world was now controlled by Orlando Fragoni. Dirk Vanderpool, partly as a result of a vast inheritance, and partly through his own ability and untiring industry, dominated the transportation facilities of the world. Planes and zeppelins, railroad equipment and ships, were built in his plants and operated by the many organizations which he controlled. Stanton had inherited the agricultural activities of the world, and, in addition to this, he was the sovereign of distribution. He owned immense acreages in all of the continents. He not only cultivated every known variety of produce, but also handled the sale of his products through his own great chains of stores. His father had been one of the great geniuses of the preceding generation, but Stanton, while inheriting the commercial empire which he had ruled, had not inherited much of the ability which had gone into the establishment of it. There were two other members of that invisible council of five, the very existence of which was not even suspected by the general populace of the world. Sigmund Lazar was the world's mightiest builder, and millions of great structures which were built of material from his own mines were under his control. It was Lazar, too, who owned the theaters and other amusement centers, in which millions upon millions of people sought relaxation every day. The creation and application of electrical power made up the domain of Wilhelm Steinholt, who also owned the factories that made the machinery of the world. Absolute control of all of the necessities and luxuries of life, in fact, were in the hands of the five men, who used their vast power wisely and beneficently. Ostensibly, the peoples of the world ruled themselves by means of a democratic form of government. In reality, their lives were directed by a few men whose power and wealth were entirely unsuspected by any but those who were close to them. 
the council room in which fragoni had received dirk and stanton was lofty and sumptuously appointed the rugs which covered the floor were soft to the tread and the walls and ceiling were adorned with a series of murals which represented the various heavenly constellations at the far end of the chamber there was a staircase and dirk was among those who knew that it led up to the great observatory in which fragoni and certain of his scientific associates spent so much of their time at night for men had commenced to talk about the conquest of the stars and it was generally believed that it would not be many years more before a way would be found to traverse the interplanetary spaces we are rather fortunate my friends fragoni said to his two associates to have been the witnesses of the event that transpired last night fortunate exclaimed stanton then you know that the thing is harmless a little smile lit the benign and scholarly countenance of fragoni as he calmly regarded stanton we know very little about it he replied after a brief pause and if our surmises are correct it may be very far from harmless it is intensely interesting nevertheless he continued because that thing as you term it unquestionably is directed by intelligence without the slightest doubt the people of the earth are about to behold a form of life from some far-away planet what that form will be he added with an almost imperceptible shrug of his shoulders it is impossible to forecast but it was so hot commenced stanton that true agreed fragoni but it also is large and it may be that only the outer shell of it was affected by friction with the atmosphere that surrounds the earth knackbaron he continued is certain that there is intelligent life within it and knackbaron he added dryly is usually right while fragoni had been speaking two more men had quietly joined them good morning lazar fragoni said addressing a short swarthy man who very apparently was of jewish extraction good morning the other replied in a soft and mellifluous voice it seems he continued with a twinkle in his eyes as if some of my pretty buildings may be toppled over soon maybe agreed fragoni and maybe he added more seriously much more than your buildings will be toppled over lazar that thing then is questioned the heavy-set slow-speaking blue-eyed teuton who had come into the room with lazar we do not know steinholt admitted fragoni but our knowledge undoubtedly will be increased considerably within the next few hours and now he said we will consider the problem at hand the object which has created such unrest is slowly rising it is now some twenty-five thousand feet above manhattan it is the voice from the radio visor attracted the attention of the five men and with one accord they rushed to the terrace and looked toward manhattan they saw the great leviathan high in the air for a moment and then suddenly it seemed to vanish from sight it's gone exclaimed stanton with a sigh of relief it must have been some odd atmospheric freak that's all they searched the skies through the lucoscope that was on the terrace but failed to detect any trace of the monster that seems to simplify matters remarked fragoni as they again walked back into the great conference room but here once more they heard the voice from the worldwide tower we are advised by chicago that the thing dull red with heat is hovering only a couple of thousand feet over the city thousands in the streets are being killed by the heat it is radiating panic reigns despite a rigorous enforcement of martial law the strange object just rose suddenly to a high altitude and disappeared it's another one of those damned things asserted stanton that couldn't go a thousand miles a minute 
"'It can go faster than that, if I am not mistaken,' said Fragoni. And it presently appeared that he was right, for in a couple of minutes the radio visor transmitted the news that it was over San Francisco, where it remained for only a few seconds. It was not more than a minute later that word came from Shanghai that it had passed slowly over that city. Then again it was poised high over Manhattan, crimson with heat. "'Is there any possible defense against it, Steinholt? Fragoni asked. The Teuton shook his head with an air of finality. "'None,' he said. "'As far as I can determine now, we can create and direct artificial lightning that would reduce this building to a mass of powdered stone and fused metal in a fraction of a second, but I am certain that it wouldn't leave as much as a scratch on that monster up there. We might try the Z-rays on it, but an intelligence that could devise such a craft would undoubtedly have the wisdom to protect it against such an elementary menace as rays. Even the mightiest explosives that we have wouldn't send a tremor through that mighty mass. Why not await developments? asked Dirk. We do not even know the nature of the thing we are trying to combat. It's solid metal, insisted Stanton tenaciously. It's a metal body with a metal brain. Don't be ridiculous, said Steinholt. It seems quite apparent that the craft has come from another planet, and, if I am not greatly mistaken, there are intelligent creatures inside it. In any event, said Dirk, it seems impractical to make any plans until we know more about it. I suggest that we empower Fragoni to act for the rest of us in this matter. That is very agreeable to me, said Steinholt. A crisis very possibly may arise in which the quick judgment of one man may be necessary to avert the danger that always is inherent in delay. You hold my proxy, Lazar said to Fragoni, and I assume that Stanton is agreeable to this procedure. The thing is moving very slowly eastward in the direction of Long Island Sound. It is, at the same time, losing altitude. Its movements are being carefully watched. As yet, we see no cause for immediate alarm. People are advised to remain calm. Yes, I am agreeable said Stanton nervously and hastily. If there are things in it with which we can compromise, I would suggest that we do not offend them. I am then empowered to act for all of you, said Fragoni, ignoring the suggestion of Stanton. He rose from his chair and walked out on the terrace. The others followed after him. Looking westward, they saw the mammoth craft descending slowly in their direction. Its vast dimensions became more and more apparent as, spellbound, they watched it approach closer and closer to them. The thing in the sky was now not more than three thousand feet above them, and only a few miles to the westward. The observers on the terrace regarded it for a moment in silence as it drifted forward and downward. It's colossal! Steinholt then exclaimed, lost in scientific admiration of the mammoth craft. Magnificent! Superb! But it's coming right toward us, cried Stanton. What makes it move, I wonder, asked Dirk, and how in the world is it controlled? It surely is not of this world, said Fragoni quietly. That gigantic thing has come to us from somewhere out of the infinite and terrible depths of space. Another minute elapsed while they watched it, speechless with wonder. Do you know, Lazar then said calmly, I believe that it is going to land in the waters of the sound. It appears so to me, anyway. It was nearly opposite them by this time, and not more than a thousand feet above the water. A few planes which very apparently were being flown by intrepid and fearless flyers, were hovering close around it. 
Then finally it came to rest, as Lazar had predicted, in the water some two miles offshore, and it was obscured by a great cloud of vapor for several minutes. Steam, asserted Steinholt. That trip around the world which it made in a few minutes generated considerable frictional heat in the shell. Come, said Fragoni, we'll fly out and look the thing over. Around the corner of the building, on the level of the terrace, there was a landing stage, which was occupied by a number of planes of various sizes. Dirk entered the door of a small twenty-passenger speedster, and the others filed in after him. Ready? he asked, after he had seated himself at the controls. Ready, replied Fragoni. The plane rose straight up into the air and then darted gracefully out over the sound. Dirk swooped straight down at the leviathan, which lay so quietly on the surface of the sound, and then slowly circled around it. No sign of an aperture of any sort could be seen in the craft. Then he dropped the plane lightly on the water, close to the metallic monster, which towered fully four hundred feet above them, despite the fact that more than half of it was submerged. It must be hollow, remarked Steinholt, or it wouldn't be so far out of the water. In fact, it most certainly would sink if it was solid. At the touch of a lever which lay under one of Dirk's hands, the plane rose straight out of the water, and he maneuvered it directly over the top of the strange enigma. Then he touched a button, and the pontoons were drawn up into the undercarriage of the craft. "'Shall I make a landing on it?' he asked, turning his head and addressing Fragoni. The latter nodded his head, and Dirk dropped the ship gently onto the smooth surface of the monster, the pneumatic gearing completely absorbing the shock of the landing. Dirk relinquished the controls, and opening the door of the cabin, he stepped out onto the rough and pitted substance of which the leviathan was compounded. He stood there while the others came out after him. A large area on the top of the monster was perfectly flat, and within a very few moments Dirk discovered that it was decidedly warm. He had brought the plane down close to the middle of the length of the strange craft, in the belief that there, if anywhere, some indication of an entrance might be found. The voice of Steinholt, tense with suppressed excitement, appraised him that his surmise had been correct. There is a manhole of some sort, the electrical wizard exclaimed, and look, it is turning. They saw, not far ahead of them, a circular twelve-foot section of the deck slowly revolving, and even as they watched, it commenced to rise slowly upward, as the threads with which it was provided turned gradually around. Almost involuntarily, they retreated a few feet, and stood there, spellbound, as they stared at the massive, revolving section of the deck. It continued to turn until fully ten feet of the mobile cylinder had been exposed, then the bottom of it appeared. Even then it continued to revolve and rise on a comparatively small shaft which supported it, and at the same time thrust it upward. Dirk and his companions kept their eyes on the rim of the well which had been exposed, and awaited the appearance of something they knew not what. When the top of the great cylinder was fully twelve feet above the deck of the craft, it slowly ceased to revolve. Moment succeeded moment as the members of the little group rigidly and almost breathlessly awaited developments. Then Dirk, with an impatient ejaculation, stepped forward toward the yawning hole and cautiously peered over the edge of it. He stood there for a moment, as if transfixed, and then, with an exclamation of horror, retreated swiftly to where his friends were standing. "'What is it?' 
gasped Steinholt. What did you see when... But the words died on his lips, for swarming swiftly over every side of the well, there poured an array of erect, piercing-eyed beings who had all the characteristics of humans. They were clad in tight-fitting attire of thin and pliant metal, which, with the exception of their faces, shielded them from head to foot. On their heads they wore close-fitting helmets, apparently equipped with visors which could be drawn down to cover their unprepossessing features. Each one of them carried a tube which bore a striking resemblance to a portable electric flashlight. Swiftly they advanced, in ranks of eight, toward Dirk and his companions, who, gripped with amazement, held their positions. The first line came to a halt, not more than four feet from the little group on the deck. The other lines halted too, and formed a great platoon. Then a shrill whistle sounded, and the formation parted in the middle, leaving an open path that led backward to the entrance, to the well. A moment later, the watchers saw the regal figure of a man emerge from the orifice, and after a moment's pause, advance slowly in their direction with a stately stride. He was tall and muscular and blond, and his attire, golden in texture, glittered with sparkling gems. As he approached them, he raised his right hand, and, inasmuch as his countenance was calm and benign, his gesture appeared to be one of peace and goodwill. Following close behind him there was a younger man who, very apparently, was of the same lineage. His expression, however, was petulant and haughty, and it contained more than a suggestion of rapacity and evil. Behind him there were others of the same fair type, all of them sumptuously and ornately attired. Fragoni stepped forward, himself a dignified and striking figure, as the leader of the strange adventurers came forth from the lane that had been formed by his immobile guard of warriors. The two men confronted each other, one whose power and wealth gave him a dominant position on earth, and the other a personage from some domain that was remote in the abyss of space. Fragoni bowed and spoke a few friendly words of welcome, and the stranger, to the utter amazement of the banker and his associates, responded in an English that was rather peculiar in accent, but that they could understand without any difficulty. "'From what part of the world do you come?' asked the astounded Fragoni. "'That you speak our language?' "'We come from no part of this world,' replied the stranger. "'The empire of my ruler is infinitely far away, "'but language, my friend, is not a thing of accident. "'Life grows out of the substance of the universe, "'and language comes out of life.' The speech of mankind in your state of development varies but little throughout all space, and I have heard your English, as you call it, spoken among those who dwell in many, many worlds. And your world? asked Steinholt, with avid curiosity. Tell us of the planet from which you come. But Fragoni, smiling at the eagerness of Steinholt, interposed with a kindly but arresting gesture. "'My name is Fragoni,' he said to the stranger, "'and I would have you partake of my hospitality "'and refresh yourself after your long journey. "'These,' he added, "'are my friends, Steinholt, Vanderpool, and Lazar.' "'I am Teuxical, vassal of his supreme highness, Malfero of Lodor, the other replied. This is my son, Zitlan, he continued, indicating the young man behind him. And the others are my high captains, Anchukan, Orzitza, and Wazibar. 
more of my officers are below, together with ten thousand armed and armored men such as you see before you. If the last part of the statement was intended as a threat or a warning, the expression on Fragoni's face gave no indication that he was aware of it. You carry a large crew, sir, Fragoni replied, but we gladly will make provisions for all of your men. As for yourself, your son, and your captains, if you will come with me. He nodded in the direction of the plane which rested on the great interplanetary vessel, and started to walk slowly in the direction of it. The leader of the sky men walked by his side, and the other men from Lodor followed close after them. Dirk, Steinholt, and Lazar brought up the rear, while the soldiers remained motionless in their serried array. Innumerable planes were circling overhead, and hundreds of them had landed on the water in the vicinity. Dirk saw that the wanderers from the stars regarded them curiously, as if they never before had seen aircraft of that particular type. When the cabin door of the plane was thrown open, Tayuxical turned to one of his captains. "'Remain here, Antukan, with the soldiers,' he commanded, "'and await our return.' Tuxical then entered the plain with his men, and Fragoni, Steinholt, and Lazar followed after them. Then Dirk took his seat at the controls. "'These are strange craft you use,' he heard Tuxical say. I have seen them in only one of the multitude of other worlds on which I have set my feet, worlds which all pay tribute to Malfero of Lodor. It is safer and swifter to ride the magnetic currents than it is to ride the unstable currents of the air. Dirk caught the significance of the reference to tribute, and he admired the clever diplomacy of Teuxical while, at the same time, he wondered if the earth and all of those who dwelt upon it were doomed to fall under the sway of some remote and unseen despot. He also realized that the Lodorians had in some way devised a craft that rode the great magnetic streams which flowed through the universe in much the same way that men in ships navigated the streams of the earth, he threw on the helicopter switch, and the plane rose swiftly into the air, the myriad other flying craft which were circling nearby, keeping at a safe distance from it. Land on the Grand Terrace, Fragoni directed. The flight was short and rapid, and it was only a matter of seconds before Dirk brought the plane down on the landing stage, which they had left only a scant half-hour before. He opened the cabin door and stepped out of the plane, and the others filed out after him. Fragoni led the way along the stage, walking and chatting with Teuxical, and Dirk, following after the others, was the last to turn a corner that brought him a sweeping view of the magnificent terrace that fronted the private apartments of the banker and his daughter. And when he did, he saw that Inga was standing there, superbly beautiful, with Stanton a few paces behind her. Her lovely eyes were alive with awe and wonder, and her slender white hands were crossed over her heart. And Dirk saw, too, that Zitlan, son of Teuxical, had paused and was standing quite still, with his unwavering and insolent eyes fixed on the girl. Resentment and a touch of apprehension agitated Dirk when he saw the expression on the face of the young Lodorian. There was admiration in that disagreeable countenance, but it was blended with arrogance, haughtiness, and ill-concealed desire. Dirk went quickly to Inga, standing between the girl and the one from Lodor, who was staring at her so brazenly. "'What does it all mean, Dirk?' she asked in a low voice. Those strange people, where are they from? Stanton had come quickly forward, and had joined Inga and Dirk. 
They're from some far-off world, Inga, he explained, that we know nothing about as yet. But what do they want, she persisted. What do they intend to do? I saw those horrible creatures through the magnoscope when they came swarming out of the inside of that thing on the water, and I thought, at first, that they were going to kill you all. No, they seem to come in peace, Dirk replied. Tayuxical, their leader, seems to be gracious and kindly. We are all doomed, asserted Stanton. Unless something happens, they can crumble our cities with heat and bury us under the ruins of them. Keep your silence, breathed Dirk, quietly but tensely. We will find a way to destroy those creatures if it becomes necessary. That man who keeps staring at me, who is he? asked Inga in a voice that betrayed her nervousness. Dirk turned and saw that Zitlan was still standing where he had paused, and that he still was looking with searching eyes in the direction of the girl. He returned the insolent gaze of the young Lodorian with an impatient and threatening stare, and the countenance of Zitlan at once became stern and menacing. He came striding in the direction of Inga, Dirk, and Stanton, and paused within a few feet of them, his rapacious eyes still fixed on the girl. "'My lady,' he said, "'your beauty pleases me. I have walked on many worlds, but never before have I seen one as lovely as yourself. Of the spoils of this world, all that I crave possession of is you. When we return to Lodor, he added with an air of finality, I will take you with me and place you with my other women in the seraglio of the stars. Dirk swiftly stepped close to Zitlan, and the latter quickly clasped a tube that hung at his side, a tube of the sort that the soldiers had carried. Your words and your manner are insolent, asserted Dirk angrily, and I warn you now to cease making yourself offensive. Dog! exclaimed Zitlan fiercely, leveling the metal tube. I'll... But the left fist of Dirk cut short his threat as it made a sudden impact with his chin, and the Lodorian went crashing backward into some exotic shrubbery with a look of surprise on his countenance. Then Dirk heard an odd hissing and crackling sound, and he felt himself becoming dizzy and weak. Darkness seemed to sweep in upon him. He felt that he was dropping swiftly through space, and then he lost consciousness. End of Vandals of the Stars by A. T. Locke Part 1